And welcome. Uh, I'm uh, Russell Sandberg and I'm the author of um, Subversive Legal History, a manifesto of the future of legal education. And I'm having a series of conversations with legal, ex legal historians and other experts um, to try to further the themes of my book, uh, which talks about the need for legal history to be at the beating heart of what law schools do. And with that in mind, I'm talking to someone today who is a legal historian at the beating heart of her law school. It's uh, Gwen Seaborn from uh, Bristol University. Welcome, Gwen. Hello, Russell. Hello. Right. Um, as per usual, if you'd like to sort of introduce yourself rather than me sort of read at you your university um, website biog, that would be uh, great. All right. Well, um, yes, I am a legal historian. Lots of people introduce themselves as I'm not really a legal historian, but I'm going to own it. I am a legal historian. Um, that's what I spend most of my time doing. So I am um, Professor of Legal History in uh, the Law School at Bristol University. Um, I'm currently on research leave though, so I'm not actually in Bristol right at this very moment. Um, and my special interest is in medieval legal history, um, particularly the history of the common law, but I'm trying to. Uh, stretch my boundaries a little bit as well um, and I have written on various topics in the kind of medieval sphere. Um, my first, my PhD was on economic regulation because when I was a young thing I, I don't know, I, th I thought that was the way to go. Um, I haven't written very much on that uh, since. I've gone over more to women and gender um, and crime actually. Um, so I wouldn't say that's all I ever want to write about, I seem, I seem to have taken that path uh, in recent times. So yeah, my latest book was on uh, women in medieval common law, and the one before that was on um, imprisoning women, so various ways in which women were confined um, in medieval England and in the medieval common law. So those are my general interests in legal history. I also, obviously, like everybody who's in law school, um, teach modern law. Uh, and my special uh, area of teaching is land law, which I've taught all the time, more or less, that I have, uh, have been at Bristol. Excellent. Of course, the, the land law is itself a, a, a historically interesting subject. It is indeed. In fact, I suppose if you were a lawyer 500 years ago, that's what you would think of as law, isn't it? That would have been the centre of your universe, hmm. common law and land. Absolutely. And today's law students, of course, they think it's crime and then they come to law school and they're bitterly disappointed. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. But I'm saying, you know, that, that land law's not interesting. But there's, <laughs> there's, there's more property law, generally yeah. speaking. Um, no, it's on, it's on okay. I, I don't mind you having a proper uh, land law. I think it is an acquired taste. Um, I think, you know, we are usually quite pleased at the end of the year if we get in our feedback returns. Not as bad as I thought it might be. <laughs> Words to that effect. Well, yeah, and I suppose that's, that's better, in a sense, than having high expectations that aren't going to be met. Yes. You know, oh, this is going to be the, you know, the, the sexy, glamorous subject. And then you go, oh, it's, you know, six weeks of um, men's rayo and actus reus and, you know... Uh, goodness knows what, but uh, yeah, so it, it, exactly, it, it's interesting that you said that you claim that, you know, you're happy to take the title of a legal historian. Mm. Um, and and so, sort of, why do you get into legal history? I, I can sort of... Okay, you know, that's a good question. And um, I give my kind of uh, conversion tale to my uh, legal history students every year. So I was a law student. Um, I chose law kind of at the last minute. Um, because it was impressive, I suppose, for a kid from a, a kind of comprehensive school background, um, law and medicine were the kind of aspirational subjects. And although I was very interested in history at school, um, I suppose it wasn't obvious to me what I would do with a history degree, so I went for law in the end. And then I quite liked it for a couple of years. Um, I can't say I was hugely enthusiastic about it, I still, probably until the end of my second year at university, thought that I would be a lawyer. Then I did some mini pupillages over that summer, realised that it just, I was not a good fit for that life at all. And I think that was, uh, that was the correct choice. Uh, and so I was a bit of a loose end when I came into my third year. And then I had the option in legal history. 
and really never looked back. So I did it as an undergraduate. Then I went for a year to the Law Commission to be a research assistant doing um, more or less legal history. So statutory law appeals, various kinds. Uh, and then I did a taught master's course and then I came to Bristol. So this was in the uh, strange old world where you didn't have to have a PhD to start as a university lecturer. Um, and uh, so I got a job at Bristol and I started to do a PhD on the side with the history department at Bristol. So that was my path, a little bit unusual perhaps. I'm really pleased that I did go down the history route. I think that opened doors for me in all sorts of ways, intellectually and just meeting people from that world as well. So I think that I really am in between those two worlds, um, which is, it's an interesting position to be in. So I go to conferences, which are history conferences or legal history conferences or law conferences, each of which has its own special uh, atmosphere, I suppose. Yeah, and, and, and that's quite sort of uncommon, isn't it? Because generally speaking, they are two sort of quite different tribes yeah, in terms of sort of, you know, the legal historians and, and then the history people interested in law, constitutional matters, that kind of thing. Yes, I think that's, that's really true. And it's quite interesting that in, I'm not going to say every university, in most universities, they don't really meet. They don't have much to do with each other within uh, any given university. So it is it's kind of, I feel like I have a slightly bridging role in between uh, law and history. And it's quite interesting. It's also really interesting going to a conference where you have both lots, both lawyers and historians, because there are all sorts of differences in the way that they study things and the way that they present a paper, for example. So at a, a sort of legal history conference, you can almost always spot the historian and spot the lawyer, depending on how they start. So classically, a history paper will start with a, a kind of an anecdote or a, a case, a case study. And a law paper tends to start with, this is what I'm going to talk about, this is my argument, off we go. Um, uh, and yes, I think, I, I don't think I'll go too much further down the route of caricature. There are one or two more things that one could say, but let's, uh, let's be polite. Yeah, I wonder if it's the sort of the structure which we're sort of drilled into in law schools, which, which, which makes us sort of adopt that slightly more sort of structured and, dare I say, formulaic um, approach. It, it, it's, 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 it's very sort of interesting. But yeah, you know, I think it's, it's the foot in both camp thing is, is, is really interesting and, and very significant, actually. Because it, it kind of because you've got that sort of training in both, mm. and, and that you know that academic reputation both in the PhDs in history, um, that sort of makes you slightly more immune to the, the usual kind of criticisms of, you know, as, as Maitland once put it, of you know the professor of law striding into, mm. um, you know, the department of history kind of thing. Um, do you think that's still a, a, a big issue in, in, in terms of, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll put it another way, I'll, I'll put it in a slightly kinder way. Why do you think that these two camps are still so separate? Oh, that's a really good question. I mean, I think that there are definitely differences in approach. There are differences in the language they use about the same thing as well. Hmm. So in the kind of what we would think of as the public law world, if you were to look at a history book, on that kind of areas of constitutional law, the language used about it would be very different. So they talk about kingship, we talk about you know, various things in public law, and there's not that much cross citation. Um, and I think what I've noticed, again, this might be a bit of a, a caricature, is that both sets of people tend to be satisfied by citing fairly old scholarship from the other side. So I think that there's, there's a lot more that could be done to sort of um, get people talking to each other. I think that's, that's one of the, the things that I would very much like to do. Absolutely. I mean, that, that, that's a very interesting point. I hadn't sort of thought of it in those terms. It's almost as if we have some understanding of the other disciplines canon. And so we go to the sort of the canon, you know, not the canonists, so that's, that's a different subject. You, you, you go to the members of that canon to yeah. cite rather than knowing 
what's currently being done or has been done in the last 20, 30 years. I mean, it, it's it's striking actually that sort of the more you, the more I, I do of legal history, the more you sort of, you, you, you I pull in books off the shelves and you sort of then look at the name, I've not come across this name before. Mm. And then you Google them and you find out that, you know, oh, they were a professor of history. And, and then before you know it, there's a whole raft of literature which you're previously blissfully unaware of. Yeah. Um, frightening, aren't it? You can feel as if you're drowning a little bit as well sometimes. It just, there's just so much, which is why I think that at this point in history, with the kind of the weight of 100 years, 150 years of legal scholarship and historical scholarship, it's almost impossible for you to be on top of everything. So that's why I think that collaboration is, is exceptionally important in legal well, history. Yeah, ab ab absolutely. I think it, it, it's, it's, it's that sort of weight and also, it's the, like I say, not knowing what's behind the thing you, you're looking at. And then often yeah. there's a huge literature sort of behind that. Um, and it's sort of, yeah, like I say, it, 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 it's, it's that awareness of the um, more recent and, and current scholarship, actually. Yeah. Because I think it's, it's often on both sides takes a slightly different form than it used to do. Mm. So it's harder to spot. Yeah. You know, I, I think if we were having this conversation 50 years ago, it would be a case of, well, we could spot what happens in history because we could just look at constitutional history as a thing. You know, we could spot what's happening in legal history because we could just look at legal history as a thing. Yeah. But now there's a whole host of people, you know, lawyers, historians, and uh, people in other disciplines who are doing stuff in what we could call the field of law and history or legal history or whatever. Um, but it's quite difficult to spot because it's so varied and, and yeah. sort of, you know, it, it's, 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 it's much harder to spot than it is, but, than it was rather. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's absolutely right. There's also a sense in which some legal history doesn't take account of scholarship in law departments. So, I mean, one of the things that we undoubtedly want to talk about is, um, is gender and women. And there's not a huge amount of um, interpenetration. It's not a very good word, is it? But you know what I mean about the effect of the massive amount of gender scholarship that goes on in current law scholarship and classical legal history. So that's another kind of bridge, I think, that has to be built. Yeah, and I think, you know, that's possibly because there's, you know, misunderstandings about what legal history is and, and, and legal history is still seen by those outside who the sort of don't call themselves legal historians and we return to that language mm -hmm. as, as being a very sort of particular narrow thing yes. um, but it, you know it, it's it's one of those situations where there's a little bit of fault on both sides actually because but to what extent are we when we're writing legal history scholarship also being aware of the non-historical legal scholarship on that area mm -hmm. I mean I agonized over in in in, in the book the chapter on uh, feminist legal history, you know, the extent to which to include stuff from feminist legal studies. Yeah. And, and you know, where do you draw the line? Um, and I sort of came to the conclusion, don't draw the line, include your <laughs> legal um, yeah. But, you know, there's other pieces on feminist legal history which focus very much on feminist scholarship by historians or legal historians rather than the general more sort of social theory type stuff yeah. and of course you know you could argue that if you, you know that same example can apply elsewhere you know if, if you're suddenly writing about or well, I'm suddenly writing about the history of a particular thing in criminal law mm. then shouldn't we be having a conversation with experts in current criminal law yeah about that and, and, and so on and so forth. So it, it's 
and, and perhaps this is the sort of the beaten heart argument, but you know, it's a beaten heart because it affects and interacts with so many other parts of the university body. Um, I can sort of stretch the analogy to breaking point. Yeah. Um, and and so, yeah, the way to, to do that is by having conversations and talking and 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 breaking down stereotypes and breaking down barriers and mm. you know, the, the, yeah. I entirely agree. I mean, I think that there there is there's one practical limit to this. And I think one of the interesting things in your book is um, the bits talking about how legal historians need to be better at uh, communicating their ideas to uh, legal law students and to legal scholars in general. I think that's absolutely right. And I would be delighted to have um, more interaction with historians and with, uh, with legal scholars and law students uh, on the subject of legal history. I think the practical difficulty with some of it, certainly with the kind of stuff that I do, is the, um, the sources. So I think that to go back to where I came from and so on and my training, one of the really important things that I was able to do as a history PhD student which is much more difficult if you're in the law world, is to learn Latin and paleography. So, you know, I don't come from a background where you learn Latin at school, um, and that, that is an issue as well, which one might come, come onto in a slightly different context, but uh, that was my chance to do it. That was my kind of protected time that I was able to learn how to do those things. Um, and it took years, it took years to be able to do it competently. And so there are sources which are not accessible, reasonably accessible to um, you know, law students and legal scholars who haven't had that kind of opportunity. So that's why it is important for people who have you know, put the years in to get those skills to communicate at a, an appropriate level uh, with everybody else. There's not any need for everybody to be going and looking at archives. But those who do go and look, in, look at archives perhaps need to uh, make a bit more of an effort to speak to not just the three people who would read one of my articles, but you know, uh, a larger population. So I think that, that's, uh, that's an important thing to say. We do talk to each other rather a lot. Uh, 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 absolutely. And I think there, there's, there's two separate things there, isn't there? There's, I think, like you say, there's that sort of accessibility issue and the having a bigger dialogue a bigger conversation issue there's also the issue of training um and, and you know it's it, it sort of one thing i think which has happened significantly over the last 10 15 years in law schools is the amount of training we now provide for phd students you know it, it, because you know, a number of phd students are now funded um by you know Bod, you know, um, research councils and various other bodies. And, you know, that I think has increased the methodology is not quite the dirty word uh, it used to be um, in law schools. Although I still think that it, it is still one of those words which is still only trotted out on particular occasions yeah. and in particular contexts. Um, and, you know, what's interesting is that and I say a bit about this in the book, is, is that at undergraduate level, the methodology is doctrinal legal studies, you know, understanding legal materials. When it comes to sort of postgraduate level, particularly postgraduate research, all of a sudden it's social science research methods. Yes. Um, almost as, as, as if you know, there's no advanced doctrinal methods they could learn. Mm -hmm. um, we very rarely put any social science research methods into the law degree, but there are obviously exceptions in certain places and certain courses. Um, but it's interesting that sort of the humanities are absent, mm. you know, despite the fact that people go on to do law and literature PhDs, history PhDs, um, that training isn't sort of provided as of right or as, as a sort of a, as a norm 
Yeah. No, I think that's a that's a good point, and I think that's um, it. It wouldn't be that difficult to integrate it into the well in the, the, the Bristol structure of somebody who's do a law PhD. You're absolutely right. They they would be doing classes in you know, quantitative methods and, and socio legal um, methods, uh, and it wouldn't be too difficult to try and integrate some legal history into that as well. Exactly. So that, uh, particularly, I think. Um, given the lessons we've learned over the last 18 months in terms of how much stuff can be done online. Mm. You know, the idea that oh, you know, there's only, I don't know, two students at the University of X who could possibly be interested in this. Um, so, you know, it's a resource issue. Disappears when yes. suddenly yeah. it, there's, there's more um, numbers. Um, but yeah, on, on the accessibility point um, yeah. and, and on the sort of the broader sort of conversation point you know are there sort of practical ways in which this can be mitigated rather than overcome i think there are and it somewhat goes against my particular interests i if i want if i was going to have a, a thoroughgoing program of you know training postgraduates or um linking legal history and modern law i wouldn't do medieval stuff I would look at things like, um, I don't know, for example, the old Bailey online database is a brilliant um, way to look at things which are relatively accessible. Um, I don't want to draw the ire of modern historians though, because I know there's an idea that um, they get a bit annoyed that people think that they can just do it. They think that it's just, it doesn't require any special training. And of course, um, the historian is a profession like anything else. Um, and uh, there have been there has, there has been one notable instance in which somebody tried to go into 19th century records, and made a huge bold claim about uh, loads of people having been executed for homosexuality offences, which was just wrong. Um, so lots of that could have been corrected by talking to people who knew about the, the field. Um, and I think that's, this is, goes back to the communication thing again, doesn't it, I suppose. But there's a need for a bit of care, but there's definitely a huge scope for um, looking at records which have been digitized. So things which are in English to begin with, so we talk about 18th, 19th century records, well, that's certainly far back enough to give you a good sense of long historical lines. So I think those sorts of things that you would start with and probably criminal records are the best places to start because it's uh, it's striking, it's interesting. We more or less understand what's going on. Absolutely, and and to sort of to, to link this back to your own work and, and 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 back to your most recent work on women and the common law. I just wondered what was the sort of the what was the spark for that particular book? What, what, what was the motivation? It's, it's something I've wanted to do for a very, very long time, but I felt slightly nervous about doing, um, both because it really is in the middle of law and history, which means there's the potential of being criticised by everybody, <laughs> not just one <laughs> um, I think there's also a kind of a, a slightly personal aspect of this, which is I've been on a journey in my academic career from um, a quite doctrinal viewpoint on legal history and a sort of, I don't know, I suppose I, I was at one point enthralled to the idea of being objective, that one could be objective. And it felt slightly wrong to talk about women because that was talking about me. So in contrast to the majority of legal historians, certainly when I started, I was a female, um, and it, it just felt as if it was something which would be slightly sneered at. Um, and it's taken me until I was you know, quite um, established in the profession before I felt I could, you know, well, essentially, what, what are they going to do to me? <laughs> I can be criticised, but um, I don't think that um, I'm in a, uh, a difficult position if I write something which is not, um, is not to the taste of certain uh, factions. So it's something to, to answer your question more briefly, it's something I've been thinking about for a long time and I've only felt able to write in the last five years or so. So I've been thinking about it for a few years. 
And also, I just think that it took a long time to get the ideas together as well, because it's um, about women across the law. It, it took a while to get on top of lots of different areas which were necessary. So it's something, it's a sort of second level book um, in comparison to some of the things that I've written in the past about one particular quite small, sometimes very small niche area. Um, it's, it's, it's at a higher level of generality that, than that. So I think it took a while to, uh, to get confidence and to feel competent uh, to do it. Well, it, 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 it's a brilliant, brilliant book. I mean, I, I, I really enjoyed reading it. And yeah, it, it, it's, it's, I, it's really, really nice, actually, to, to be able to do both of those things in terms of the sort of the deep dive and then the more sort of thematic um, exploration. And the book does actually, does both, because at various points you sort of deep dive into it. Mm. Um, and it, it's, it's quite a subversive book in terms of, you know, it, it's, 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 it does challenge an awful lot of um, the throwaway sentences you find in the literature. Mm. It sort of, you know, deals with women very sort of, um, very much as a sort of a, a, an afterthought. And, and very much in terms of, well, it, it's coverture, yeah, full stop. Yeah. Um, and, and sort of, you know, what's great about this book is, you know, we, we've had and are having a, a significant amount of people, legal historians or people who might not call themselves legal historians, doing work on the history of women in the sort of the early modern and modern era. Uh, and, 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 and this was exactly what we needed in terms of saying, Look, you know, this is a relevant topic, a pivotal topic, actually, yeah. and, and, and a more complicated and more nuanced topic in the Middle Ages than is assumed. Um, and it kind of links up quite nicely with other bits of literature on, you know, which, which has been coming out, in, in, particularly in the specialist journals over the last, I don't know, five 10 years or so. Mm. But, um, and interestingly, it's in a um, it's in a history series, isn't it? It is, yes. Yeah, so it's, uh, I suppose I've gone over to the dark side completely, haven't I? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was, no. was that sort of deliberate? Sorry. Was that, was that a, well, obviously it was some, it was a deliberate choice, but I'm just wondering. Yeah, I, actually all of my books have been in, in history series. Um, I can't excavate actually where that came from. <laughs> and then I find them uh, good to work with generally, uh, the history of publishers. Um, yeah, I don't know what the readership of something like that would be. I suppose this one really does again sit in the middle. The last one, one about imprisoning medieval women, I think that probably was a history book. Mm. Uh, but this one, yes, I would, I would hope that it would have some audience in both law and history. Mm. Well, it, it, it's, it's a very good read. It, it, it's does exactly what we were talking about earlier in terms of accessibility. Mm. It's sort of, you know, and, and, and it, it does that trick of you're reading it and you think you know where it's going. I mean, it sort of pulls rug from under you uh, at, at, at various different times because you kind of think, oh, yeah, yeah, this, this is going to be, you know, the, the usual coverture stuff. Mm. And, and, and then it sort of, you know, pulls and, and plays around a bit with structure and, and, and yeah, it, 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 it's, it's the joy of a thematic book rather than that sort of, um, specialist is the wrong word, but focused book, if I could yeah. like that. No, I, kind of come at the yeah, topic from different angles. Yeah, I messed around with various different ways of doing it. At one point, it was going to be a kind of chronological thing, but that, that just, it was very clumsy and lots of repetition. So, um, yeah, thematic it ended up. Or yes, more or less thematic. But no, I, it's it's very nice to get it finished, as is the case with any book. Um, but I've enjoyed working on that and thinking about it, and I continue to think about it. I'm sure that I'll find things that I wish I had said or um, that I'd like to add to it uh, as I go along, because I think that I'm likely to stay um, in the area of women for a lot of the rest of the time that I do research. 
it is something which I think needs some more attention from local historians. Well, yes, I mean, in, in, in a sense, it's, it's kind of a nice sort of launch pad from where to then go and do the sort of the more focused stuff, whilst at the same time being able to refer backwards in terms yeah. of, you know, if, if you need the background on this, go over there. I'm now drilling in this particular, um, you know, area of the garden. The use of a better analogy, I mean, who drills in my garden, I don't know. But you, you <laughs> get the, 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 the basic point. But, um, so what are you working on at the moment? Um, I have got a, a far too many things on the go at the moment. Right this week, I'm doing some more work on petty treason. So women who kill their husbands and um, if they're convicted, end up being burnt. So I'm still, uh, still looking at that, which is interesting, grisly, horrible. Um, and it's quite interesting from a, um, from a sort of personal point of view doing research. One of the things about it is when I'm kind of looking through some old archives and I know that I'm not going to find very many of these cases. So how does one react when one finds a case? The, the urge is to sort of be a bit of a bit of a punch and yeah, yes, I found one. And then you think, oh, but that means some poor person got, uh, got burnt at the stake. Um, so there, there's an interesting kind of question to oneself to be put about things like that as well. How should we feel about uh, these people so very long ago? Absolutely, because you, you I, what's quite interesting about that is you kind of forget when you're doing modern law that these people are, are, are real. You know, you just yeah. see them as, as a case citation. I think actually with the history stuff, because I don't, I don't know why, but they do feel more like people sometimes mm. than yeah. sort of, yeah, it, 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 it's, a, it's a strange one. You know, you, you sort of you talk in criminal law about sort of, you know, people being murdered right, left and centre. Um, and, and, and think nothing of it. But then when you're sort of dealing with stuff historically, possibly because you're dealing more with broader materials, possibly, or, 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 or more lively materials, or, or less censored materials. Yeah. Because, you know, a law, a law report tells you precious little, actually, about mm. anything other than, you know, the material facts. Yeah, I think that the, what, the thing that often strikes me when I'm looking at very old records and England in particular is very well served by um, the stuff which remains in the National Archives and much of which has now been digitised. But it is extraordinary to think that this little entry that says somebody did something or was not found, was found not guilty of something, that's probably the only trace that remains of them. So it's quite something to look at the names and I often sit there and just think about you know, what, what were these people like, how were they like me, how were they not like me, which is a bit narcissistic I suppose, but you know, I think we, we all try, we all make these connections almost involuntarily. Oh, absolutely, and, and it, it, it's, it's that sort of, yeah, like I say, I, I, I think it's in a sense easier to connect because of the distance over time. Um, and, and because in a way also they're sort of they're, they're not contaminated by the stuff you might find out about them if you yes. take them out of their local <laughs> context yeah that's you know, all there will be yeah, yeah. But, uh, no it, it 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 sounds fascinating and you know and again it is one of those topics which you know there's always a, a, a paragraph on it or a sentence on it mm -hmm. in, in 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 works you know and you sort of yeah, yeah, I, I, I therefore know what petty treason is, thank you very much. Um, but again, what your work is doing is sort of revealing the stuff behind um, and, and, and kind of bringing it alive in a way that it's, it's, it's very easy for it to not be when you're sort of, you're not talking about people. No, I think that's absolutely right. And I think one of the things that I hope it does. It's quite an old fashioned thing, really, which is just putting women back into the, the narratives which have been constructed um, and which serves as again, as your book um, brings out, it serves to question those narratives, doesn't it? So studying legal history as an undergraduate, which I loved, um, you realize that some of the stories that you're told are really very simple and simplistic. So things are always triumphing or rising in nice lines. Um, and once you chuck women in there, 
then something like, I don't know, the development of defamation takes on a different character because the sorts of things which um, became actionable at common law, actually, if you think about it, were more suitable for men than for women. Um, and that point really is, is not made, that there's a, um, a divergence in terms of where saying a woman was a whore would go and where saying a man is, I don't know, not suitable to do his business would go. So one would be common law, one would end up probably being a, a church matter or a local matter. Uh, and that doesn't really feature in the standard law school classical legal history tale of the rise of this kind of action. Absolutely. It, it, it's adding the sort of the colour back in. Mm. It's adding the complexity back in. And you're not then also adding in a sort of a new story which sort of just fits in between existing chapters. You're also rewriting, as you say, you know, the other chapters as well. It, 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 it's, you know, it, I, I don't know how you could aim to write legal history without paying attention to gender actually it's 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 you know it's it's obviously it, it depends on the context but i can't think of a single context where it wouldn't be gendered mm. um you know and, and and where that isn't just about adding an appendix at the end and i must say that i think that this is a, a matter of legal history, doctrinal legal history, needing to talk to just law, the law school, because I don't think my colleagues who teach the core legal subjects, I don't think any of them don't have gender and, you know, um, discussion of race and so on within their taught, their crime, their land law. We even do it in land law. Mm. Um, so I think that, that, that the some, somewhat insular nature of legal history within the law school um, needs to be broken down a little bit, even if just to talk to your colleagues within your own law school. Absolutely. And, you know, it, it's it's about then picking up the extent to which those fields are now informed by different perspectives than the traditional doctrinal, mm. um, you know, pale male focus. Um, and also, I suppose, you know, looking at the modern law as well and, and, and modern law developments um, and, and, and even things like, you know, the use of authority mm. um, and, 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 and the use of experts and, 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 and the use of commentators. Um, you know, it, 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 it's, it strikes me there's, there's quite a lot for both sides to learn there. Um, in, but in, in, but also, like you say, yeah, it, it, it's, 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 it's the insular nature of legal history, um, which I think is beginning to change. Oh, I think so too. Um, um, I, let me give you just one, one last example of the insular nature of legal history. <laughs> this is one out, out of the uh, out of the book, and it, it came to it came to my attention actually from teaching. So. I started with a legal history course, which was very much like the one that I had, which was essentially private law based. And then bit by bit, I introduced more crime, more family, and the students liked it. So I continued to do that. Um, we started to learn about rape in, on, on the unit. And so I tried to send the students off to read in the standard introduction to English legal history about rape. And they and I were very surprised at just how little there was in um, Baker's introduction to English legal history. So I think I'm correct in saying that there are four sentences within a larger section on personal injury on rape, and it ends in 1285. So nothing of any interest happened after 1285, which is, um, is interesting. Um, you know, I mean, it's a fantastic book. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to knock it by any means, but um, it has some areas which uh, are a little out of step with what's gone on in legal in law schools on the whole in the last 30, 40 years, and that would be one of them. Mm. So and, yeah. yeah, and indeed what goes on in history departments yes. where no. there's you know where there's a huge literature on you know the history of sexual offences etc 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 it it's sort of um 
Yeah, you know, it, it, it's, 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 it's that opening sentence, isn't it, of the penultimate chapter in Milsom, which yes. says, you know, uh, the history of crime can be shortly told. Yes. Nothing worthwhile yeah. was created. I, I, I'm paraphrasing slightly, but that, that, that's, that's, more the, less that, right, that's, that's yeah. the gist of it, which, um, you know, like I say, doesn't really correspond. Uh, no. And standing between law and history, it is um, it seems particularly strange because actually what historians who are law adjacent are most interested in is criminal law. Um, criminal law and to a, to a lesser extent family law, which might shade off into a bit of property, but criminal law is uh, is the most kind of happening area, I think, amongst those sorts of scholars. So it probably seems very strange to them looking over the fence to see what isn't there in the kind of classical legal study. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it would be fascinating, actually, to be able to map the, the change in focuses of different scholarly communities mm. on this thing, because, you know, I've I'm, I'm just been reading uh, The History Men by John Kenyon, mm. uh, and, 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 and that makes the point that sort of until the 20th century, constitutional history dominated history departments. Yeah. So I, 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 you know, I wonder whether the decline of constitutional history and, and the sort of, you know, the move towards social history, the move towards gender history, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, being able to map that and whether there's any sort of correlation between that and the sort of the change in fortunes of history. Um, in legal education, mm. in, in terms of you know the, the amount of people who are doing it, in terms of the amount of courses, you know, the interest in the field, yeah, and perhaps it's only now that we're kind of coming the ever out to the other end of that. Mm. Um, it's quite interesting in that um, a couple of years ago, I looked into what used to be taught on the Bristol Law Degree when it first started. And I was surprised to see that there were one or two sort of compulsory courses in legal history, but a bit of excavation showed that they were essentially constitutional history. That's what they were doing. So perhaps at that point, um, the two things were closer together in a way. Uh, that was in I think, the 1930s. Hmm. We moved a bit further apart. Yeah. I wonder if they're now moving close together yeah, again. No, I think so. I hope that so. sort of interest in gender, race, Social history generally, um, you know, issues to do with power, issues, yeah. issues to do with equality, and it, it might well be, but it's 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 a framing thing that's getting in the way. But we're sort of framing things differently, mm. um, and and hopefully the sort of the thematic approach might actually help significantly there, because suddenly we're talking the same language rather yeah. than. You know, um, well, this 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 isn't for me. That book isn't for me, or that, that article isn't for me, or, 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 or that sort of journal isn't for me. You know, yeah. I, I think it, it it's there are linguistic boundaries here um, because of the, the sheer amount of stuff there now is. In, yeah. in, you know, in 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 comparison to, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago. Yeah, and it's all that's I think it's true. Yeah, that's absolutely true. You know, I think one thing which um, I've found quite a positive thing, and which it links back into your um, thoughts about the fact that legal historians need to communicate better, is one of the things that we've all been doing rather a lot more of during the pandemic, and perhaps a little while before that as well, is blogging. Um, I think that that is a really good way of forcing yourself to speak in the right. Um, accessible language. And I quite enjoy doing that. I've surprised myself. I quite enjoy writing a, a thousand word piece on something rather than you know, a 10,000 word piece on something and just putting the absolute um, key points down there in a way that people can understand. And perhaps also sort of topping and tailing it with uh, some link to the present or some um, something that's going to be of interest to people who are not just in my little field. So I think that's that's um, it's one of the ways in which we can uh, we can reach out beyond the ghetto, if you like. Yeah, I mean, I hadn't thought of it like that, actually, yes. I mean, I, I think 
it's 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 in a way also it's 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 bridging the gap between our activities in terms of research and teaching mm. because the, the same skills which you've just described you know as a blogger are the same skills you use as a teacher mm. you know particularly as, as, as a lecturer as, as I, I suppose but yeah you know it, it's I think it, it's about sort of bringing those things together and as you say realizing there's a whole host of different ways in which you can disseminate what I quite enjoy about blogging is that it allows you an opportunity to play with stuff mm. uh, in a way which doesn't matter so much because it's not going to be committed to print no. um, and, and so you can be slightly more playful slightly mm. more creative slightly more risky with it yeah, um, I must say I also find it really useful in teaching. So I, I I enjoy writing it myself and sort of disseminating ideas. But um, I do also find that my students in legal history, if I want to give them something on crime, for example, as I said, there's not so much in classical legal history books. So I would be sending them to history things, and they're law students. They're not history students. They don't necessarily have the background in history to really get everything out of. Um, some historical articles because they have the parallel problem to the one we have, which is they're talking to their people. Um, so I quite regularly um, send them off to a blog, maybe to a blog and then to an article, but sometimes just to a blog um, because there are some very uh, worthwhile, high class, relevant um, history and legal history blog blogs to send them to. So that's been a, an excellent development over the last few years. And I suppose the number of recorded seminars and lectures there now are. Yes. Um, because of COVID. Um, and, 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 and that again, I think, is, is you know, I'm, I'm finding a, a tremendous resource Absolutely. this year in terms of being able to say, you know, rather than me tell you about what so and so said, you can actually watch them. Yeah. Um, you know, and it, 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 it's, it's nice to be able to sort of, to, for them to put a face to a name and, and to yeah. sort of, to see that you know there's other people who are interested in this and it's not just me going off on one yeah no i think that's right i think that that is um that's part that could be part of the, the sort of solution to our slight communication problem couldn't it um because probably we're never going to be um a huge body of people studying legal history um, as you know the central thing that you do um but if we can be connected up in one way or another through seminars through uh, online presentations through blogs that would certainly uh, advance the cause, wouldn't it? Absolutely, yes. I think it, 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 it's sort of there's a whole host of things which are now becoming as normal as breathing almost, which mm. you know, 18 months ago were fairly alien. Um, and you know, hopefully that will be the one good thing that comes out of the pandemic is is oh. that um, we can be more connected and in conversation more without having to physically be at various different places. Yes, it's certainly a, a boon for accessibility, being able to talk to people in different countries and so on as well. So it's all good. Excellent, fantastic. And, you know, I, but I, I, I do think at the end of the day, although that's important, the other key yeah. thing is, is that, you know, the accessibility of sources and you know the accessibility of books and articles which enable basically they they are the tickets of entry um to to, to, to misuse that phrase um to, to to legal history to understand a, a way in and like i say i think you know your book uh, most recent book on women and the medieval common law uh, definitely does that and, and definitely is, is, a, is a fantastic way in which subverts uh, expectations and um, I, mean, I think one of the things that I wanted to say is that obviously my book is about women in the common law I think one of the things that I've noticed particularly coming from history is how much people write about the law but not the common law and I think that's quite interesting and also quite subversive so one of the things that we you know because there's not infinite time, when you do a legal history course, you tend to do the English common law. Because for a law student, that seems to be on a nice trajectory to where we are now, doesn't it? 
yeah. but we forget sometimes that there are things that were that have been left behind so sitting where you are in wales um there's a whole tradition there which existed until the tudor period and, and in, in some ways in some attenuated ways beyond that as well um which you know, if you are in wales and you're thinking about the existence of both of those things that's a a good route towards subversion, criticism, critique, and so on. And then there are all sorts of other bodies of law, as, as you know very well, um, which don't get a great deal of time in law schools, but get a lot of time in history study. So that's why that kind of bridging thing, again, is important, I think. And also, you know, that can work in terms of bridging, that can work in terms of extending the, the, the gaze of, of, of legal historians and legal history modules, but also that's a contribution then we can make to the wider law school and wider legal education. Yes. In terms of saying, you know, look, law is not as narrow as you think. And, you know, the social theorists amongst you start talking about legal pluralism. That's not a new <laughs> phenomenon. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we've got stuff here which, 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 which is, you know, a, a, a neat illustration of that. I mean, you know, like I say, the Welsh experience, but countless others, you know, mm -hmm. the sort of um, John Baker's idea about the two bodies of law, uh, you know, the, the common law and, and, and the teachings of the law. Yes. Um, and, you know, we don't, a, we don't separate the two, but also nowadays, and this is a point I, I, I think I make in the book, is we don't recognise the distinction between the two. So, you know, we, we, we just sort of, you know, in criminal law classes, contract law classes, you know, we're, we're citing these people, these commentators on the law, mm. um, and what they say about the law, but not realising that that might be an interpretation and not yeah, realizing yeah. that that's going to be you know that that's we use the term gloss only when talking about medieval glosses on the law mm. whereas actually you know smith and hogan on criminal law or treatle on contract or whatever they they're all glosses mm. um you know and even with the more sort of comprehensive judgments we now have um of sort of you know particularly the higher court level of Supreme Court judgments, which look as if they're sort of, you know, right in textbooks sometimes, in terms of the way in which they're written. Um, oh, yeah. Even with that, they, they don't outline every single principle. Mm. And, you know, where are those principles outlined? Well, they're outlined by academics. So it, it, it's, you know, there's, there's lessons there that can be learned. And, and, mm. You know, I do think that sort of multiple bodies of law and where you draw the line um, thing is, is, is really key, actually. It, it, it's, it's, you know, this isn't sort of a, an arcane or esoteric point. Mm. Um, That's true. I think that um, I, one thing I would say about um, Supreme Court judgments is, does your heart not sink when you look at a modern Supreme Court judgment and it says at the beginning, it, there's a, it gives you a kind of cast list at the beginning. You know, you're in a hall if it's got to explain who 12 different people are in a, a in a property case. But Absolutely, yeah. I think that's that, that's very true. Um, and, you know, it, it's worth having a word now, isn't it, I think, about how you think that we could infuse more historical thought into teaching of modern law. Yeah, I, well, I think it's... it's there's there's various different ways to come at that question there's the way in which we tend to come at that question is the institutional mm. which is in 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 some respects the dullest way of of, 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 of approaching it right you know in, in, in terms of you know the, the question often becomes oh you know should it be taught as a particular module or taught you know within particular modules and I, I think the more interesting way to do it is, is, is not to think in those terms, but to think more in terms of would it be valuable to frame a particular discussion historically? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think for a significant amount of areas of law, they are more interesting 
if you look at them for a historical lens. Um, they are more intellectually rigorous and interesting if you look at them from a historical lens. Um, it instantly gives you a, a, a sense of comparison which otherwise you don't have, or if you try and do it by reference to another jurisdiction, becomes more difficult and, and more um, problematic in, in, in terms of um, materials, language, um, accessibility, etc. So yeah, you know, I, I think there's there's a real need for, in the same way that you know we've started to think about looking at our curriculum through the lens of gender, through the lens of race, through the lens of the social context. Um, I think the same thing needs to be done in, in, in relation to history. Um, and also, I mean, my instinct is to catch them young. Um, you know, it, it's, it, it, or the way we kind of do it, it at Cardiff, I think it sounds pretty much the same way as you're doing at Bristol, but we've got this optional module. Yeah. Um, which they do in their second or typically in their third year. Um, and that then allows them to sort of look back at their law degree and go, ah, oh, yeah, it now makes more sense. Yes, get lots of those comments. Yes. Um, you yeah. know, it, 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 I understand it, things now, yeah. Yeah, you yeah. know. But I'm just wondering, you know, how much better it would be for it to make sense from the beginning? Yeah, <laughs> no, know. absolutely. And yet without, how can I put this, without tedium. I mean, one way you could do it is is through the kind of, you know, this is what the courts were in 1100, this is what they were in 1500, et cetera, et cetera, which would be, which would be tedious. I don't actually think that you have to go back so very far as all that. And I don't think it's necessarily in my um, research interests, but uh, I think that finding the historical story for even things from the sort of 20th century uh, is beneficial. Um, but, you know, we, I, I agree. I think that it would be good to infuse some um, historical side to things from the beginning, because, you know, as you point out and as we know, um, it's impossible to do law really without having some sense of history. Um, you know, just thinking about land law, and I try not to bang on about land law too, too much, but there's the institutional aspects that you have to have some inkling of, the fact that certain bits come from the common law, certain bits come from equity, and there's a, a different mood, if you like, um, in the rules on each side. But, um, you know, if you have the space to do it and you want to do it, um, there's all sorts of other historical stuff that you can get into in land law. So it's not coming from me, it's coming from other colleagues, particularly Antonia Layard, but we've um, we've, over the last several years, looked at um, kind of colonial aspects of land law uh, within the land law course, which students enjoy very much. So I think things like that can be introduced uh, into even something which seems quite so mundane as land law. Absolutely. And I think it, 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 it's that question of, you know, you don't have to be comprehensive. You can't include everything. So, you know, you can then be creative about what you're picking up, um, particularly if, if, if you're then able to point to stuff to contextualise and, 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 and to give other parts of, of the missing story. Yeah, your, your point about the 20th century in particular, I think, is really, really important because, you know, it, 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 the extent to which is that now should that now be seen and treated as legal history? Mm. Um, and, and, you know, is there need when we're talking about, I don't know, Lord Denning's property cases, to really now put that in the context of the time as, as, as part of that story? I think there really is. And in that particular context, in the context of Denning and property law or, or the kind of constructive trust, the creation of the new model constructive trust, so this is getting a bit niche for anybody who's not interested in land law. Um, when I teach land law students, it is absolutely necessary to give them a bit of a, a picture of what um, family law was for quite a large swathe of the 20th century in order for them to understand what's going on in those cases from the 60s and 70s, which are kind of either side of big reforms in family law. Um, 
And, and also just to get them to understand that if you're looking at a case, let's say of a, a marriage or, or a partnership has broken down, you actually do need to be looking back 30 years to when these people got together and thinking about what was, what was the world like then, not looking at now and thinking, oh, pathetic woman, why can't you go out and get a job? You know, so I think that there is a need to have some concept of both the law um, 30, 40 years previously, but also social conditions at that time. Yeah, I mean, that, I think, really underlines, you know, the basic point of, of, of my book, in a sense, in that, you know, it, it's the need to do history properly because it's always there anyway. Yeah. You can't, you know, you, you can't ignore history and law, but you can do it badly. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you, you can sort of do it without giving proper attention to. Um, and yeah, it, it's, it's one of those things, isn't it? That sort of, where do you draw the line in terms of history ending and, and, and yeah. the current law beginning? No, because, I, I agree. I you know, you get... um, yeah, sorry. sorry, you get into a very weird situation. I don't know whether this you're a bit younger than me, or I don't know what, what, uh, what it was like when you were a law student, but I remember my landlord textbook, um, several of the chapters began now since 1925. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they had this very strange kind of, uh, I don't know, timeless view of, uh, of the world. So, I mean, obviously there was a big change in 1925, but it's written as if nothing had happened, nothing had changed since like. Yeah. Oh, wow. But, uh, yeah, no, I, I was speaking to a, a new student earlier this week, um, and he, he'd studied history at A-level. So I said, so, you know, what did you study? Um, so I studied um, modern English history up to Tony Blair. I think Tony Blair is now in, 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 in the history. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it's, and yeah, I mean, that, that's something I think, for, for legal historians in particular, is something really to grapple with. Yeah. You know, where do you, where do you stop and the sort of the the contract law specialist or the criminal law specialist takes over? You know, and it, mm -hmm. it, it's it's obviously going to be different for each yeah. uh, area, but it, it's it tends to be a bit vague on on uh, in the in the legal history course. But yes, that's that's right. There is um. Yeah, you could take it from when the big textbooks start to be written in a subject and then it's kind of set to a certain extent. Mm. Um, lots of people stop, I think probably said 1875 for many years while I was doing legal history because that's when the judicature acts reorganise the courts. But yeah, there's no there's no right answer to that one, is there? Yeah, yeah. And, and there's that sort of... It's a bit early. <laughs> yeah, and there, there does seem to be quite a dearth of literature on the 20th century. But yeah, I think a, a good book on um, 20th century legal history is overdue. Yeah, yeah. There, there's there's one for family law, Cretney's yeah. book. Yes, which which, which 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 is brilliant. Yes, it is. Um, there's there's a couple of ones I think come out in recent years on contract and tort. Mm. But yeah, an, an overriding book would would be uh, would be very very um, welcome and uh, yeah. overdue. <laughs> if anybody's listening. <laughs> if anyone's listening, indeed. <laughs> right. Well, excellent. It's been fantastic to be joined uh, with you this afternoon, Grant. Thanks very much uh, for the chat about all things subversive. Yes. And um, just to say once again that your book, Women in the Medieval Common Law, uh, is available, published by Routledge. And uh, yeah. thanks very much for joining me and uh, join me again for another subversive conversation. Thanks, Russell. Keep subverting.